All right, and we're on. This is it. Get <laughs> ready. Get excited. Get get sit down. Yeah. <laughs> How about you do the actual intro right now? <laughs> hey everybody, welcome to Don't Copy That Floppy on Chipit.net, uh, Chiptune Internet Radio. We are a weekly video game news show hosted by yours truly, Lex, and, and my me, co-host. Dan. Yeah. This is a special Monday edition. We usually broadcast on Fridays from 7 to 8 live. So this is a surprise treat for those of you who listen to the show, the radio station on Mondays. We were too busy being free on Friday. Yes, enjoying our all-American freedom. Yeah, if you're one of our British listeners, uh, you lost, I'm sorry. (laughs) So, so, that's why we had the day off. Is because you didn't win. So, <laughs> so what kind of articles are we talking about today? Uh, we're talking. We're gonna be talking about Cliffy B. Everybody loves to talk about Cliffy B. We're gonna be talking about some um, some departures from Blizzard Entertainment. We're gonna be talking about um, some Nintendo investor silliness. We're gonna be talking about uh, esports again. Talking again, about that last week too. More esports things yeah. going on. Uh, talking about some. Of more of the many studies being done about violence in video games. Really interesting. More interesting stuff. Um, and then some little tidbits about Dragon Age Inquisition, about Metal Gear Solid, and some other old games. All capped off with a review of Shovel Knight. Shovel Knight! Long time coming. Uh, I've thoroughly got beaten that game at this point. Did so. you prepare any puns for your review? Oh god, I should have. I can't believe I didn't. Oh no. Um, and then as usual, we'll end with a little uh, look at some upcoming titles mm-hmm. within the next week or so that you might be interested in. So let's get started. Um, you're the one who found this Cliffy B thing, so... Oh, Cliffy B. Lay it on us. All right, so... This is where we would play the explosion sound effect if we had found a good one on time. We didn't do that. <laughs> one day we're going to have a soundboard again. Yep. Just wait. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Cliff Blazinski, who uh, may, is a guy who makes video games, you may... He's been making him. video games for quite a while, actually. Yeah, um, he was the guy behind, I believe, um, the Unreal franchise, yes. and also Gears of War. Yeah, he got so, a lot of, um, like, notoriety from Gears of War, because he was a big part of promoting it, like, personally himself, so... He's definitely a big deal in the community, and Absolutely. in 2012, I believe, he decided to retire. Yes. Because he was like, I made all this money, and I'm like, not even 40 yet, I'm going to just retire, or whatever. Yeah. And I was like, oh, you lucky guy. <laughs> um, so he did, and, um, you know, he stayed active on the internet, doing yeah. stuff like blogging, posting yep. on Twitter, all those sort of things. Yep. Um, but he announced recently that he's coming out of retirement, and he's starting a new studio called Boss Key Productions. Now, this is from an article in Polygon. Uh, what was the date on this article? Uh, it was on July 4th. It was on Freedom Day. Oh, Freedom Day. <laughs> it makes sense that they talk about Cliffy B on Freedom Day. Yeah. Uh, he what, loves, a, what an all-American. <laughs> just loves explosions so Video much. games full of explosions and burly men patting each other on the back. <laughs> That's what America's really about. Football the game. Football the game. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, he, he and, um, let's see, what's your the um, he, there, there's uh, what's this other guy's name? Arjan uh, Bruce. Yeah, Arjan Bruce, who who um, worked on hit on uh, Jazz Jackrabbit with yeah. him way back in the day. So him and that going to be his co-founder, starting Boss Key Productions. Yeah. Um. um what, and what was it? What did you say their tagline was? Um, unlock the fun. Yeah. Is what it says in this picture here. Good job. So so good. Uh, um, does, does, did this article say anything about any games that they had announced, or is it just the founding of the studio at this point? Um, I think it's just the founding of the studio. Okay. Um, um, on the Bosky official Twitter page, the header image also mentions a Project Blue Streak. Um, but though that link has since been removed. A Blue Streak Twitter account was also linked on the Bosky webpage. These links have since been removed from the web's website. Oh, you so know what? So they do maybe have a project There is a lot right of speculation now? because um, while Cliffy Beaver is retired, he, posts, he had been posting all this concept art for this like science fiction looking game that looks yeah. super epic and stuff. Uh, so a lot of people are thinking, 
maybe that's the project that the studio will be working on. Right. And that would be cool because the concept art looks really cool. Mm -hmm. So that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, other than that guy coming out of retirement it's the and starting the studio, there's a, a huge amount to this story. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess... And it does say he's going to reveal something game-related on July 8th, actually. Ooh. So... Yeah. <laughs> Get ready. And he said that this will be a... His new endeavor is will have a lean, agile, and fun startup. So who knows what the heck that means. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Thanks, Cliffy B. Explosion. <laughs> Get ready for tomorrow when he reveals that. Yeah, so pretty soon. Um, uh, so following on that, more kind of industry, industry figurehead news um, over at Blizzard Entertainment. Um, Rob Pardo has left Blizzard Entertainment after 17 years of working with them, a career which included um, StarCraft, StarCraft Brood War, WarCraft 3, Diablo 3, and more, including um, being one of the lead designers for World of Warcraft um, since its inception. So he was a big deal. He pretty yes. much shaped what Blizzard, a is lot of what Blizzard now. was and is, yeah. Yeah. So, aside from the very early Warcraft games, he pretty much had a hand in almost everything, it seems. Um, so he, he waved goodbye, though. Um, now, uh, in this, you know, it's sort of weirdly ironic, I guess, that he's leaving now in the middle of, or near the end of production of their new expansion. The uh, War of Wands wow, of which is, expansion. Which specifically harkens back to the time no, when he first started working there. It's funny. <laughs> um, but it's, it says that um, he was currently working on it, um, and that uh, expansion is due later this year. But it also, this article on Polygon from uh, July 3rd also states that Blizzard has not yet named a replacement for him as the lead designer. What are they going to do? So I'm... I just kind of been wondering what the circumstances of him leaving are, because it seems weird for him to just step down in the middle of development. Yeah, um, I, I mean, mean but I, I, I mean, it could just be he decided to leave. Yeah. Um, it just seems like an odd time to do it, rather than waiting for Warlords of Draenor to come out. Or something, you know? I don't know. It's not like... I don't know, like... It doesn't seem like they have any reason to want to can him, just because... Yeah. He's done such good work for them. Yeah, I don't think that there's anything sinister going on in the background yeah, here. He was, I'm just wondering what he was might probably be going on. just like, man, I've been here a long flipping time. Yeah, he says that he does not have um, a plan as to what he's going to be doing next. For now, he's just going to kind of take a break. Go hang enjoy. out with Cliffy B. Yeah, go hang out with Cliffy B at Boss Key. Boss Key Studios. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, he he uh, is just interested in checking out. Um, a lot of the new games that have been coming out too, it seems. Like, he's interested in, in playing plenty of games and thinking about what he might do next, it seems. So, um, this gives him a nice opportunity to do that, though, because if he's not stuck to lead designing everything at Blizzard, he yeah. has plenty of time to kind of sink his teeth into what's been happening in gaming outside of Blizzard for a while now. And I'm sure he's in a position that if he wanted to retire, he probably could, just yeah. because, I mean, if he was involved in the inception of World of Warcraft, I'm sure, I'm sure he has piles of money. Yeah, and he'll be able to get another job easily if he goes to another studio or something, oh, or wants to found his own, he'll yeah. have no trouble, because he's got... 17 years of awesome credentials you know just with be, Blizzard. You know it be really interesting if he decided to go off and try to make another MMO? That would be interesting. Because all we see are, because WoW was... Warcraft clones, yeah, more or less. So, I feel like the worst case scenario of what he could make for that was just a really good World of Warcraft clone. Yeah, but, you think but at the same time, I would hope that he would be like, I, I was a lead designer in World of Warcraft, I know what makes it tick, I know why it's fun, all that stuff, here's something different. Yeah. Like, he could use what he knows from World of Warcraft to specifically create something different from it. Um, that would be interesting. That would be see. super cool. I, I hope he like, does something like that. God knows we need an MMO that's not just World of Warcraft. Oh, we totally do. Because there's so many MMOs come out. And, and there's so much potential in the genre. Yeah. But it's all squandered on trying to be like WoW to make money. Like WoW makes. Yeah. No one's going to make money like WoW makes until WoW is dead. Like. 
That's, that's and it. WoW will never die. If WoW will never die. We've learned. I've said it before and I'll say it again. The only thing that will kill World of Warcraft is World of Warcraft. It's they going to, it's going to undo it itself cool. eventually. It's still a long ways off, though. And no other game is going to dethrone it, though. No. There's no way. It would have by now if that was going to happen. How long has that game been out? Um, I believe it released in 2006. Man, that game is old. Perhaps late 2005. Dang. Yeah, it's it's a good eight or nine years. Oh, they're going to have a ten-year anniversary soon? Soon. <laughs> Man. They made it. That's that's quite the feat. Somewhere in a basement, someone's playing EverQuest and being like, listen, you don't know anything about old school yeah, right? MMOs. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, um, yeah, looking forward to more from Rob Pardo, because clearly he's a, he's a talented guy. He knows the industry. Um, it'll be fun to see what he does next. Oh, definitely. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how Blizzard fares without him. Also, I think. Maybe they'll um, go going in, forward. Maybe yeah. they'll go in a new direction because I would actually love to see them go in a new direction. Me too. They've properties. been kind of stagnating a bit. Yeah. I feel like not to say that their games have been bad, but they all have begun to just feel too. Like even Diablo three has a, a distinctly almost World of Warcraft feel to it more so than Diablo two did. Yeah. Like they're definitely everything's kind of blending a bit too much as far as their design philosophy goes. I think. Between their RTS games and their, like, hack-and-slash things like Diablo and their MMO yeah. stuff. So, I don't know. We'll see what happens with that. <laughs> um, let's talk about Nintendo. We always talk about Nintendo. We like There's to. always There's something fun, about Nintendo to talk about every week. So, here, you take us into this one. Okay, so in an article published by Kotaku on uh, this past Thursday, which was the 3rd, I believe, yes. um, there was... An annual investors Q and A, uh, in which uh, one of the investors uh, had some very negative things to say about uh, his fellow investors at Nintendo, and, Nintendo. and about Mr. Iwata, yeah. specifically as well. Um, and man, we talked earlier about how Iwata had a ridiculously high approval rating. Yeah, even after um, the in Wii spite U, of the Wii U failure and the lack of sales, he still had like seventy percent approval or which something. Which is great, which is yeah. how bad financial straits they've been in. Like. Okay, so I'm gonna read you this guy's quotes because they're really funny. Um, <laughs> so he says, "I do not understand video games, and I feel angry because at Nintendo shareholders meetings, the shareholders always discuss things related to video games or such childish topics." as what the future of video games should be, while I, for one, was flabbergasted that Mr. Iwata continues to hold his position, although he has had, or he, he has said, said that he would resign if the company's performance were bad. Um, now, obviously, this is translated from Japanese. Yes. Um, but <laughs> it's just like... And he, he says specifically after that, I hope the Nintendo shareholders meeting will become an opportunity where shareholders discuss the company's business operations from the viewpoints of capital gain and dividends. So, so this guy is like... Hardcore business Mr. Man. Investor Businessman. Yeah. Like, in his mentality about the whole thing. This is not about the art of making video games and producing a good product. This is about making cash. And this is how mm -hmm. I like, assume no that, attached. that, like, investors for every other video game company, yeah, this like, is especially, how I, like, like, EA. Yeah, oh, absolutely. This is how I imagine is, like, this is, like, the almost cartoonish, but probably somewhat accurate picture of a lot of these video game company investors. Um, and like you said, EA, um, I also want to bring up even um, some parts of Sony, the guy, that guy who came out during Sony's E3 press conference was like, I feel like he was this guy almost. He was, he was just guy. with a little more charisma, maybe. Um, but he, he he struck me as the guy who's like, we're looking at this from a, a money-making standpoint and nothing else. Hmm. I don't know what a video game is. Just make me money. Like, And there's apparently been some other um, news stories about similar sort of things like this where um, uh, uh, different shareholders have urged Nintendo to go into just making smartphone games. Yes. Um, and uh, use microtransactions. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, I don't like complimenting Kotaku, but they say it really well at the end of this article. Don't you just hate it when Nintendo talks about video games? Isn't that the worst? <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so, yeah, obviously this guy's hardcore businessman. Oh, they're also, they had some... Um, 
some nice responses where they were just yes. like, we appreciate the tough comment. Um, um, they're very, they're very, uh, like, gently saying, like, mind your own business almost yeah, is kind, kind of how it reads to me. They're, they're basically telling him to shut up in the most polite Japanese way possible. So Japanese. And at the end, once again, we appreciate these valuable comments from the shareholder. <laughs> very Japanese. Um, but anyway, uh, this actually, overall, even this is like a hilarious story, and we can make fun of this guy, but I think that at the end of the day, what we should take away from this is that this is extremely positive because this is one guy who's an yes. investor. And maybe there's one or two other investors that think like that, but the fact that this is a story is because he's the odd man out at the yes. Nintendo shareholders means because they're they're discussing childish topics as, such as what the future of video games should be. At a video game company. Yeah, and that's amazing, and that's a really positive thing. It really goes a long way to explaining why Nintendo just rocks so hard oh, yeah, um, compared to a lot of the other companies, because their shareholders care about video games and discuss video games, and that's yep. what motivates them in their business. Right, and allows all the other, all their developers, like Iwata, or, or, well, it allows Iwata to focus on that with all of the developers and, like, Miyamoto and everything to just make video games without yeah. having to worry about this financial side of things, um, which is how it should be. Yeah, how it should be with every game company, and I'm sure yeah. this is the only game company that works like that. <laughs> yeah, I'd be willing to bet. But don't worry, Boss Key Productions. Boss Key Productions, Cliffy B's got our backs. He's gonna, he's gonna be all about the future of bro video games. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> what does the future of PAX and video games hold? <laughs> Cliffy B that tackles these tough questions every day in shareholder meetings. <laughs> so if you just tuned in, um, you are listening to Don't Copy That Floppy on Chipbit Radio at chipbit.net. Um, we are an uh, internet video game ri news radio show. We have a Facebook page. Don't Copy That Floppy. Go like us. Uh, we're also on Twitter yes. at... Um, at DCTF podcast. Okay. I actually didn't know what our Twitter thing was yet. Well, now you know. I'm getting information out of this on my own. <laughs> um, and normally we broadcast from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. on Fridays. This is a special Monday edition because of the 4th of July, mm -hmm. um, which for Americans like us is the most important day of the year. I had a lot of grilled food. Me too. It was good. It was great. <laughs> Any excuse to eat grilled food. So next up, we've got some more esports news. Oh um, man, okay, so this is... So you, you you told me about this before we started, so get us into it. Alright, so this is from, this is some news that broke last week, um, and specifically the article that I'm citing is from Forbes magazine, and it was posted on last week on Wednesday, which was the 2nd of yeah. July. Um, and there's a little bit of background to this. Uh, basically what went down is in South Korea, they wanted to hold a Hearthstone tournament. Yes. Along with some other games as well, but mainly Hearthstone. Um, and they said, okay, well, we need some of, um, like, esports organizers to come in and, like, run this. Right. Um, so they contact, I believe, a Dutch company that I knew blanking on the name of, but I'll get to it later. Uh, oh, a Finnish Hearth... Um, yeah. I don't finish. know. Yeah, finish. <laughs> it's um, a finish or like tournament organizing yeah. thing. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> basically, they they were setting up the tournament, and they set it up with uh, separating into gender divisions. Yes. And a lot of people were like, "Wait, what? Why did you do that? Like, why did you make a women's league and a men's league for this tournament?" Yeah. Um, and the the Finnish company said, "Oh, well, what we're trying to do is be we're trying to get esports recognized as sports, right. um, because that is sort of a big deal with esports right now because they're so new, relatively, um, and they're trying to go to other sports." organizers of like you know physical sports and be like oh listen we're like a legit sport too you should include us in stuff and business dealings and things um so their thought process was well physical sports have different divisions for men and women yes so esports should have that too right um without really thinking whether that made sense or not because it, it doesn't. doesn't make any sense <laughs> because esports uh, differ from physical sports in the way that they're not physical. <laughs> yeah, um, that's about all there is to say about it. I mean, like, 
you can look at you look at um, most physical sports, and there's a lot of like like you look at football or something, American football, for any listeners who are in the UK, American football, where you have a lot of like body on body contact, and, I, and a lot of it is just to avoid like, you know, weird stuff <laughs> from happening. Um, and then there's you know the issues of having separate locker rooms and everything. There's a lot of factors as far as all that stuff goes um, when it comes to having men and women playing on the same sports teams for most sports. But with esports, there's no locker rooms. There's no, like... You wish there were locker rooms. It gets <laughs> real smelly. <laughs> but... There's none of that aspect of it. No. Like, and there's... It's just nothing. It's just all about your brain and playing video games. Maybe your, like, like Twitch reflexes, which I don't yeah, think really that, differs between I don't genders. Think, I don't believe it does either. Um, um, so this first got discovered because, or like, uh, there was a, there's like a press release, and it talked about how only male players could play yeah. in this. In this, I kind of like, I kind of, I, I kind, I kind of like this, uh, this quote we've got here. Yeah, do you want to read it? I was yeah, about sure. To. Yeah, PC Gamer um, asked the organizers if um, that was a translation error. Yeah, if that that only male players were allowed in the tournament, um, and they responded, "Your information is indeed correct." The tournament is open to Finnish male players only. Um, in accordance with International Esports Federation tournament regulations, since the main tournament is ov- is, the main tournament event is open to male players only. What I love is what he says next. This is to avoid possible conflicts, e.g., a female player eliminating a male player, among other among things. Other things? You don't want those male players' feelings to be hurt. Yeah, when they what, what is on. that supposed to mean? Like, what is that supposed to mean? That this, there's some disaster if a female player eliminates a male player? It also implies that there is a difference between the genders and that women are just better at video games. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, I don't think that makes sense we either. Can't, we can't do it. Uh, it's ridiculous. But yeah, um, so it's the International Esports Federation. Yeah. Was the IEF. SF. Yeah, and they seem to think that, that in order to promote esports as legitimate sports, they like need to do this, which is absurd. And but it's and it's sad if they actually do need to do that. It is really sad, and I, I, like honestly, I think it's cool that esports don't have to be gender segregated like that because it's different from all other sports. It gives it. It's almost. It's like a new. It's like. It's like, it's about time we can get over this and just have something, at least, that's not gender segregated as far as sporting events and competition goes. Like, that makes it pretty unique and cool in that way. Yeah. Like, I like that. But, this, this, so it's like, why are we getting rid of that unique aspect of it? It's dumb. And it's been going so long without being gender separated either. Like, well, I think that, I think that it's it maybe been not going... as esports, but it's... People have done land parties and land competitions. Oh, definitely. And tournaments and things like that with no sort of gender segregation whatsoever. I, I, I and yes, there the, are fewer female players, but who cares? Like that doesn't make a difference in this case at all. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that it's because even though it's been going on for a long time, it's not in the past couple of years that there's real money. Yeah. So now people are like, oh. Like esports needs to be more official, and then they're just yeah. jumping to this conclusion in, a, in an attempt to make everything more official sounding, and it yeah. just doesn't make sense. But I think if they just start showing that they're making tons of money, that will make it official. The, no, it totally like, will. People will jump on that regardless of what other things they have in place. And um, it starts making money. Yeah, I mean, Blizzard uh, throwing a Hearthstone World Championship, and it has a one hundred thousand dollar like first yeah. prize. So there's like, man, there's money. There's some money going on, um, but yeah, that did seem to be the the cornerstone of IESF's argument is that they thought that this is the only way they were going to be looked on, upon as official, right? And that's dumb. So uh, <laughs> a lot of the internet complained, rightfully so. Yep. Uh, and oh yeah, they had another quote here: "The decision to divide male and female." Um, competitions was made in accordance with the international sports authorities as part of an effort to promote esports as a legitimate sport. Does that mean they went up to like these people and were like, look, look, we gender segregated it. Well, I Will think you it, pay attention to us I now? think it was more that they were like, we want to be part of your club. How do your rules work? And they were like, well, we, we better gen- just follow these. Yeah, without thinking about our actual yeah. sport. 
Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. Uh, the they they um after the, all the uproar on the internet, they they went they, back on this. Correct? Yeah, they they changed it. Yeah. There was also like a lot of great support, especially from Blizzard, because mm -hmm. as we know, Hearthstone is the the cornerstone yeah. game in the tournament, and Blizzard makes Hearthstone. Yes. Uh, and Blizzard had come out and said like, oh, if you're gonna host a tournament like that, you can't use our game. Yeah, which is good. Yeah. Because that probably was a big wake-up call for them and pushed them strongly in that direction of changing their mind. Um, so thanks, Blizzard. Good job. <laughs> thanks. Um, Thank you, Rob Pardo. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, what we got next? Um, a Time Magazine article from June 30th. Oh man, so this is a little, a little older. But... A little older, but that's because of our our Fourth of July shenanigans. It's true. Um, um a so new study. This is, this is super interesting. Yeah. Um, um, it's yeah. A new study uh, says playing a terrorist in video games might make you more morally sensitive. Might. 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 <laughs> so we but. so we know that there are all these different studies all the time about how violence in video games makes you a worse person. Yes. Um. That's or one rather, of the strongest arguments against video games in general. Yeah. Is that they are violent and it makes you violent. Yeah, and, and I mean, it's not like that argument is completely without logic. I mean, yeah. you are, if you're playing as someone who, like, brutally murders other people in the video game, then, like, I would be concerned that that would have an effect, especially for someone who's very young who's playing the game. Very young or just people who have already standing mental issues yeah is a big one and well. i mean a lot of that especially the youngness factor it should be dealt with the fact that there's a rating system and yes. that children shouldn't be playing call of duty because but their parents are buying it for them anyway yeah and usually in those situations i say the fault lies with the parents because yeah. you should know what your kids are playing um and if you have yeah, you're buying them those games you should know you're asking um, for it but uh but this, but uh, I think one of our first episodes actually, we talked about how there was a study uh, that proved that video games don't actually have that effect on you. Right. And now we've got this other study that even goes further, saying like not only do they not have the, that effect, they actually have the opposite effect. They're actually good for you. Yes. Um. So this is like crazy to me, and it's it, it was a very <laughs> specific study of a specific situation. Yeah. Um, and obviously it's only one study, so there needs to be a lot more to figure out if this is just sort of a, an anomaly, which would right. be fair. Um, but the idea was the uh, the players would play as a, a terrorist um, or a UN peacekeeper. Yeah. And when they were the terrorist, they were trying to... I believe they were trying to kill the, a UN peacekeeper or just, like, UN troops. Yeah. Um, and they would do both missions because those were, like, the mission objectives. So they, would, they wouldn't, like, not want to play the bad guy. Um, but afterwards, when they were asked about it, they would say, like, yeah, well, when I played the terrorist, I felt really bad about doing that stuff. And yeah, I really and wish that it, I says, uh, it says, after playing the games, the people who played as terrorists were asked to recall what um, acts induced guilt, and the UN soldiers were asked to recall which acts did not make them feel guilty. And then they all completed a um, moral foundations questionnaire with that stuff in mind. Thirty items. Thirty items. Questionnaire. Oh my goodness. This is in depth. <laughs> um, an American who played a violent game as a terrorist would likely consider his avatar's unjust and violent behavior, um, violations of the fairness, reciprocity, and harm care domains. Uh, to more. To, to be more immoral than when he or she performed the same and acts in the role of a UN peacekeeper character. Yeah. Um, so this is... Oh, this is the University of Buffalo who did this study? Um, yes. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so the study found significant positive correlations between video game guilt and the moral foundations uh, violated during gameplay. Yeah. So, yeah, I think this is really... Uh, a really positive sort of piece of data because yeah. it tells you that people are not just a not just a sheep sheep like yeah. as a lot of people think they are. Yeah, it's 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 telling us something completely contrary to the like you are a human being if you play a violent video game it will make you violent. It's showing like no people are people think about this. Stuff. Yeah. It's not just like we see a thing and are like oh, a thing. 
like it's like hmm, I'm gonna think about thing instead and see how thing makes me feel. And is like, this is this wrong? Does, yeah. Does this not seem like a like, good people idea? People are playing video games and they're not just like running through them. They're thinking about their actions within them. I mean, you look at um, games like I don't know, like Mass Effect and other things that give you choices, like moral choices, and I feel like it's almost applicable to those as well. Because I know for a fact there are people who like pick, will pick a thing in a game and feel horrible about it later if it doesn't turn out the way they wanted it to and will reload the game and just pick the other thing. So there's clearly some level of like actual guilt going on here if you do a bad thing in a video game. I remember when I played Mass Effect 1 Yes. and Ashley kills or attempts to kill, what's his name, Rex? Yep. Sorry if we spoiled it for you, people. It's not the end of the game. It's, it's just also, something that also happens. the game is really old at this point. Yeah. So get over it. Get over it. Um, <laughs> also, that doesn't necessarily need to happen. It just no. may happen. Yes. Um, but yeah, so she did that, and I was like, no, I feel so bad. Yeah. This is my bro. Yeah. I can't let this happen. So I had to go back to yeah. before that and play it again and make sure that it didn't happen. Um, <laughs> that abhorrent violence. So bad. Um, so. This is, um, I'm really glad the study came out. I think that there's, one of the things that I'm worried about with it, though, is that it's not so much about video games as it is about the way our society is. Now, I'm going to yeah. go on a quick rant that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with video games, but uh -oh. does have to do with the study. I'm going to talk about the top ten Seinfeld episodes. Listen, that's coming up later in the episode, <laughs> right? I don't want to. I don't want to spoil it. Courtesy of IGN. <laughs> Damn it, Jerry. <laughs> um, so, no, but uh, because they specifically in this trial, because uh, it took place in America, and the people you played as were either a terrorist or a UN peacekeeper. Yes. Because of the way things are in America since nine eleven, like people don't want to identify with terrorists. Oh, absolutely not. And I, so, I'm wondering if this would have been different if it was just, like, a guy who was shooting, like, innocent people, but gotcha. there, would, there were not the labels of terrorist and UN peacekeeper. Mm. And I think, and I, I worry that that might have made, like, that if that's the way they did the study, then people wouldn't have felt as, like, morally unhappy with right. doing that stuff. Right. And that would be, so I just wish that this study sort of had more scenarios yeah. that it could have gone through. Um, I get the feeling it was a pretty, I mean, they had 185 subjects. I get the feeling that it was kind of a small yeah. study overall. Um, so it wasn't meant to be a super significant thing. Um, but I don't know. Uh, it is definitely... Interesting. It is super interesting. Uh, it, but it does make sense from a psychological standpoint as well that if we, if if we are forced in a game to commit heinous acts that make us feel bad, we will probably think about those things before we actually do something in the real world that would make us feel bad. So it, 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 it I can see where the logic follows. It makes sense to me when it's presented like that. Yeah. Um, um, and I, yeah, and I hope this is something that they do more studies on and really, because this, this seems like a very positive first step yeah. towards saying that video games don't mess you up and make you a horrible gun Tony maniac. Yes. Um, those kids, they played Doom too much. They played Doom too much. They made them shoot up everything. Doom, the most violent video game ever. <laughs> oh no. Um, so, from that, uh, speaking of choices in games <laughs> and character choice segues, you. segues really nicely into our next story. We're talking about Bioware. Talking about Dragon Age Inquisition. Yeah. A game that will probably have lots of choices. Lots of choices. Lots of moral choices. Uh, so this is from a story in um, the New York Daily News. Yeah, though this was reported on like everywhere. Yeah, it was reported this, everywhere. This flew out all over the place as soon as they, uh, they brought it up. But it was announced um, around like July 1st or yes. the... That, that generally or the really very end of June. Yes. Um, so this is about um, Dragon Age Inquisition. Specifically, it is about um, one of the main party members of the game. So one of the main characters who you can recruit and have with you in your party. Um, a mage. He is a, a mage, correct? Yep. Yes. A mage named Dorian. And 
the reason that they bring it up is that they are saying um, Dorian is he, he's an openly gay character is the big thing um, they are claiming that he is the first fully gay character like in a mainstream game which I don't think is true. Well, but <laughs> I think that I think that's how it got reported all a lot. You think the that's quote, not actually what they said? The quote we have from the writer David oh. uh, Gator. Yes, which is uh, maybe a it's, funny maybe name. It's in this context. Maybe it's pronounced Geiger. Let's, let's hope it is. Um, <laughs> so he says Dorian is gay. He is in fact the first fully gay character I've had the opportunity to oh, write. Okay, okay. So maybe that's being misreported because I did see it reported other places as, like, the first openly gay character in mainstream video games. Yeah. Which I actually know for a fact isn't true, um, because there's one in Mass Effect. There's a character in Mass Effect 3, I believe, who is an openly gay character, and is not a major character, but is there yeah. as an openly gay character. Like, it's not subtle in the game. Like, it's, it's pretty clear. <laughs> um, and I don't mean that, like, that he's, like, they did it all stereotypically. Like, he just, you talk to him, and he talks about his husband and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And it's like, that's fine, whatever. Um, um, what, was, what were we talking about with Ryan the other day in terms of super stereotypically, like, um, in one of the early South Park games, you could play as Big Gay Al? Oh, Big Gay Al, yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, so th we're not talking about Big Gay Al here. Yeah. We're talking about, like, a guy who's gay. But there's definitely <laughs> been gay characters in video games for, like, a while. A while. Um, um, also, there's been, there has been some exploration of it, um, not necessarily in mainstream games, but um, Persona 4 um, has a character in it who may or may not be gay. And it is very much left up to the player's interpretation of the character, which I thought was a very... Um, I don't know the right word, but a, a very um, good way of doing that. Having the character not be committed to one or the other, and the story doesn't culminate, his personal story in the game doesn't culminate with him realizing he is straight or gay. He could be either, and it's not important. It's just how his character arc fo follows, and what it's left up to the player's interpretation, what you think. Yeah. Um, and I, I like it that way as well. Um, so this kind of thing has been around. Um, gender identity stuff. Um, surprisingly, a lot of Japanese games have actually handled it mm -hmm. with varying degrees of um, class. <laughs> Persona 4 did it very well. I have seen a lot of Japanese games that do it horribly. Um, but this is... Well, we know with Bioware, it's... Um, it, they've been doing this kind of thing a lot now. I, I think kind of I read become, that it, it started in, like, uh, KOTOR? Yes. I believe where... Um, Juhani, one of the Sith... She's, a, she's a, a dark Jedi who can join you and be become good again. Yeah. But she is a lesbian, I believe. Um, I don't know if she's bisexual or not, but I know she at least will get with a female main character. So I don't think I tried to romance her because in Bioware games, I rarely try and romance anyone because that's like not the part of the story that I, I care about. I had to romance Garrus. You don't understand. <laughs> Good on you. He was a He's catch. so dreamy. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah. So what they've been doing in video games for a long time is making not only can your character in these RPGs be either Male gender, or female, yeah. Um, but then you can choose to either be gay or straight, yeah. depending on who you want to romance. And there are numerous NPCs of varying, yeah, like sexualities. Um, um, but for this one, it's like one of the first times that they've said, uh, "Here's a character that you'll." be able to romance, yes, because they're in your party, but if you are a female character, you will not be able to romance him, because he doesn't yes. swing that way. Yeah. And I think that's the biggest difference. That's the big thing, because usually they've been, like, bi or something. Yeah. Um, I know Dragon Age Origins had a bisexual character, or two bisexual characters, I believe, but no, like, fully gay characters. Yeah. Um, I'm going to bring up, I do have, actually, kind of a problem with this being so heavily reported on, and kind of put out there. Okay. Um, and that problem is not that there is a fully gay character. I think that's cool. My problem is that given the social climate around gaming right now, where so like um, gender and sexuality and feminism and all of that stuff has become such a hot button issue in gaming, I kind of feel like they are using this and, and they're, they're using it as marketing in a big, big way. And I feel like it kind of feels sleazy to me and kind of underhanded almost. 
that they're doing, and I almost feel like they're not doing this because they want to be that progressive. I feel like they're doing it because they know it will sell games. And yeah, get people think, on their side. I think that's a fair idea. I mean, I'm not going to say that that's all of it, but I think I feel like that's at least a big part of all this and why they are showing this, why this has been reported on so many places is probably because Bioware gave this information to so many places because they want it out there. And I just, I don't know, I feel like that marketing side of it just leaves a really bad taste in my mouth mm -hmm. when I see it because they're not, they're not being... It, it feels like it cheapens it to me a bit, I guess. Like, I appreciate that they've done it, but I don't like that they're using it as this big advertising figurehead for the game. And, like, you know, the game looks great. It's probably going to be great. And I think the game should stand on its own merits, and I kind of don't like that they're like, our game... It feels to me like they're almost saying our game's going to be even greater because we have a gay character in it. And it's like, that doesn't affect the gameplay. Yeah, because it, it should like, be that you play the game and you're like, oh, there's a gay character, and that's cool. Yeah. And there's no need good, to make like, a big And that's cool that they it. put it in there. Yeah. Like, but they're, they're, it, I feel like they're almost pandering really hard by shoving this out there in the forefront of the news about the game right now. And I just, I don't like it. And I mean, I, I, I and I'm not saying, like, I, I want to, like, be 100% clear that I'm not saying this character should not be in the game, and, like, this character was just made up as marketing. I just don't like how they're handling the whole situation surrounding the character as far as, like, announcements about the game and news and things go. I feel like it's a little, it's a little sleazy, in my opinion. All right. Which is my personal opinion. Go on our Facebook and yell at me if you want. Like, I'm going to But fine. I'll still probably play the game at some point and enjoy it and hang out with Dorian. He seems like a cool guy. He does seem like, he has a sweet mustache. He has an excellent mustache. That's, like, the first thing I noticed when I saw the character. Plus, he's a um, mage, and mages are awesome. And it is, um, and, and contrary to what I say, even, um, the, the writer said that, um... The, the way that the writer, that David Geider, or Gator, I don't know how to pronounce his name, um, talks about him is, like, he's put a lot of personal stuff into writing the character. So I feel like the character will be excellently written, and I really like that. But once again, it makes me kind of sad, because this guy clearly put a lot of heart and passion into writing this character and making this character be who he is, and now it's just being used as this, like, cheap advertising gimmick, I feel like, almost. And it seems almost insulting to David as well, in that sense. But that's video game marketing for you. Video game like, marketing. This is really me complaining about video game marketing more than anything else. <laughs> um, but yeah, so yeah. <laughs> it is what it is. Yeah. Um, as a side note, am I the only one who thinks that the helmet the main character wears in Inquisition looks dumb? Am no. I the only one? It who looks really that? dumb. It looks really I dumb. I hope you don't have to wear it all the time. I don't want to. It looks dumb. I'm going to play that game, I'm going to find a way to take off that helmet and <laughs> throw it in the trash. Uh... <laughs> Mostly because we're going to play a mage character. You can't wear helmets as it doesn't make any yeah, sense. Yeah, if you wear helmets as a mage, you'll make a dork unless it's like an animal skull or something. Yeah, and you're sweet. like a necromancer. Because then that's cool. Yeah. That's super cool. <laughs> anyway, moving on. <laughs> moving oh, on. If you just tuned in, uh, you're listening to Don't Copy That Floppy on Chip It Radio. You can listen to us by going to www.chipit.net. You can either listen to the outside player or download a playlist file. Um, we are a weekly uh, video game news podcast. Uh, we broadcast usually on Fridays from 7 to 8. If you're listening in live today, it's Monday. Uh, we couldn't broadcast on Friday because we were too busy celebrating our freedom. Eating hot dogs yep. all day. <laughs> uh, shooting guns. Shooting guns. <laughs> you know, all that I, good stuff. I did play a lot of Bro Force on Friday. Knitting flags. <laughs> but, uh... What every good American does. <laughs> exactly. But we're, um... So we're on Facebook, uh, Don't Copy That Floppy, and we are also on Twitter, Woo! at DCTF Podcast. Yes. So follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook. We'd super appreciate it. Um, and tune in. And tune tune in. in on Fridays and listen to us. Yeah. This Monday thing will not be normal, so you can find us Fridays. <laughs> exactly. Um, what do we got next? We have a thing I found that's kind of a little two-part thing. Um, this is actually from June 27th, so it's a bit old now. And then the follow-up is from the same day. Um, so, um, as most people probably know, Metal Gear Solid V, um, The Phantom Pain, had a new trailer um, at E3 this year. Mm -hmm. um, a very well done, interesting trailer um, about Big Boss. 
um, and going just nuts. going nuts in the upcoming game, and it looks great. Um, and a bunch of Hollywood folks, um, specifically the producer of Spider-Man and X-Men, uh, Mr. Guillermo, or uh, Avi Arad, Mr. Guillermo del Toro, director of such movies as Pacific Rim and Pan's Labyrinth, um, the Hellboy films, Nicholas Winding Refn, director of Only God Forgives and Drive, um, and Park Chan-wook, the director of Old Boy. The original Stoker, Old Boy. The original Old Boy. Um, and some other guys, too. <laughs> uh, talking about this trailer for Metal Gear Solid V. And I thought this was cool, because you don't see, um, like, film industry people talking about games that often. Um, in any capacity, more than, like, a little, like, plug, almost. Like, a sound bite or something. Yeah. But um, these guys had a lot of really, really positive stuff to say about um, Metal Gear Solid V based on what they'd seen and about Hideo Kojima as a game director and creator. Um, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll read Guillermo del Toro's because it's a little shorter and it's funny. Um, Kojima-san remains a massive... Like he says Kojima-san. <laughs> remains a massive inspiration for me and Metal Gear, all caps, continues to deliver the edgy, vital, jaw-dropping world and feel that we've come to expect, but it pushes the envelope every single time. It is a window to the future of the medium and its breathless narrative and artistic expansion. Amazing. Um, uh, the Drive guy said that the trailers for Metal Gear Solid V prove once again that Hideo Kojima is a master at portraying a wider and more complex view of human nature, combined with breathtaking action sequences. Um, a daring and bold move from one of the founders of the future of technology. <laughs> um, and then the old boy guy said... I've always been thinking that I want to see a film directed by Mr. Kojima, but after seeing the latest trailers for Metal Gear Solid V, I realized I was wrong. He has actually been making films in his own way already. Metal Gear Solid games are already films, the films of the future. The films of the, the future. future! So this is some really high praise from these guys. Yeah, from like, people who definitely know what they're talking about. As far as film and everything goes. Um, and it's interesting, um, Hideo Kojima has said before that he always wanted to make films, um, which would explain why his games have such long cutscenes. <laughs> um, and, but they also have that certain flair for the cinematic. Um, he's always very good about the cinematography and cutscenes and just conveying the story and character through even very simple scenes. He really nails it. Most yeah, of the even time. in like um, Metal Gear Solid for the PS1. The first, yeah, even with characters that literally did not have facial expressions. Um, you Man, Psycho some... Mantis has a crazy backstory. Right? Like, there's some real stuff <laughs> going on. You shed a tear for that, man. Oh, man. <laughs> and it's it's crazy. And it's he just has such a flair for it. Flair for the theatrical, this guy. And um, what I what, what, what uh, I want to go into next from that is a Kotaku article following up over that titled, Hollywood Directors Gush Awkwardly Over a Metal Gear Trailer. Um... This guy, this was written by Mark Serrells um, of Kotaku on the same day, the 27th, um, and he keeps reiterating in this article that he's a huge fan of Kojima and his work. He loves Metal Gear and he loves the stuff Hideo Kojima's done with it, but then he completely rolls back on that and says that these guys are, are praising him way too much and are saying, like, this game is amazing, this is, this is great, but what the stuff Kojima's been doing with this series is fantastic and is really elevating video games, and this guy's saying... This guy's basically saying, oh, well, Metal Gear's just video games. It can't be that great. Um, and, but then he keeps saying, but, but I am a great big Metal Gear fan, though. But they're not that good. But seriously, though. But seriously, they're know. not worth much, though, <laughs> as an art form. What, um, with this smack And he of... even says that the, the, the old boy guy, um, Park Chan-wook, said he's actually been making films in his own way already. And this Kotaku guy says... That's the refrain of almost every single Metal Gear Solid detractor on every video game forum ever made. Which is true. People complain that Kojima's making movies more than games, but so what? Like, he's making games with sprawling stories. Like, it's what he's been doing all this time. That's also, so, that's also not how that quote is meant to be interpreted. No, he's at, not at all. Because it says he's actually been making films in, in his, his own, own way. way. He's not making films. He's making games that are almost imitating film and, like, using the same techniques as film, which is something that a lot of people aren't doing. Yeah, it's like, it's clearly that's the way that it's said on forums and the way that director said it. Yes. Is, there is a different meaning. Absolutely. And that seems incredibly obvious from just this, reading the quote Like, from the I director. saw this Kotaku article and I was baffled by it. 
because also Kotaku is a video game news site, and they're, they have an article here that's basically saying, this is silly, video games can't be art. Like, video games can't rival film. And I'm gonna, I will say that, like, it is rare that a game does, I would say, rival film, like, rival great film work. Yeah. But it's possible. Yeah, it's, it's happened. It's entirely possible. We and, all love Shadow of the Colossus. Oh, it yeah, happens. absolutely. <laughs> it's, it happens. Um, so but the no, fact so that a video game site is, is talking crap about Kojima and Metal Gear in it, this article is ridiculous. What, what it seems <laughs> like to me is it seems like this stereotype that sometimes shows up with gamers yes. where they're like this is my thing yeah. and you're an outsider and I don't uh, want you yeah. to talk about I it. I didn't even think about it. Because you way. can't possibly love it like I you do because so you don't know. Film people don't understand it really. Only I understand yeah. it. So I just, I, I hate when other but people talk about the thing that I love. So many people mine. are fighting so hard though to get video games recognized. As like I know, film. right? So we don't want so people why, like this journalist to yeah, say stuff like this. Mark Serrell's if you're somehow listening to this, please post on Facebook and tell us why you hate video games. <laughs> because it's always, you always want to be more inclusive. Yes, and the fact that these really great filmmakers are pulling for video games in this way is excellent. Yeah. That's awesome. That's exactly what we want. Like, Because mm. it encourages video game makers to make better stories in their games exactly. and make more cool games. Yes, and it encourages movie people, like talented people from the movie industry, to help work on games yeah. and elevate them to be something more. Like, that's what we want. <laughs> so, boo Kotaku, yay Hollywood. <laughs> um, so, quick aside after that, before we get into our game review, Super Time Force. A game that we both think is awesome. But we haven't played yet. Because it's only on the Xbox 360 and I don't want to hook mine up. Too lazy. Too lazy <laughs> is coming to Steam. Yes! So hyped. We're, there is no date listed yet, but this is some great news. We're going to buy the junk out of this. We're going to buy the junk out of it. And then play it too. <laughs> and then play it too. I'll play it too. I'm going to play it as the dinosaur on the skateboard. So if you're looking time. forward to Super Time Force, you don't have an Xbox, but you have a computer... Check it out. You're in luck, my Pick friend. it up. You're in super good luck. So we will keep you posted on this. If absolutely. We hear more about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd imagine that since they made the announcement, we'll have a date soon. Um, this article is actually from the 3rd of July, so it's a few days old. Um, so maybe within the next couple weeks, we'll have an actual date given. Um, and without further ado, let's talk about Shovel Knight. Shovel Knight. Shovel Knight came out on the 26th of June. Um, I have almost beaten it twice. Played through it once, and I'm on the final levels and New Game Plus, the more difficult New Game Plus. Um, you picked it up as well. Yes. Correct. Um, um, so what? So for those who do not know about Shovel Knight, yes. it is an indie game, sort of. Um, yes, it was a Kickstarted yep. game. Um, about Actually, the Kickstarter was about two years ago. It's been a long time coming now. Um, but it finally came out. Um, it is a retro-style 2D platformer. Which most people, when I say that, say, "Oh, another one." Oh, another yeah. another indie two D platformer. And that's a fair thing to say. It is there are a lot of it, those. We're inundated with them, but Shovel Knight really feels like something special. No, it's it's head um, and shoulders above all of the other absolutely. things that you so see. So please, on. like, if if you've seen it and are shying away from it because you think it just looks like all the others, like, give it a go. Um, it is totally worth it. Um, because it, it apes all those old games, like Mario, Castlevania, Mega Man, has colors of all of those in it, but it really is its own thing. Um, it, it managed to just not be a copy of those games. It really feels like its own, own story, its own world. It's not an imitation. It's a whole thing unto itself. And it, it was shocking to me that the guys who made this weren't a bunch of veterans from, like, Nintendo oh, yeah, or absolutely. something. Because it seems like they took this genre as if they were guys who'd made yes. games in this genre before yes. and just perfected it. So they tweaked gameplay in all these little minor ways yep. that make it so much less frustrating. They clearly understood all of the things that were good and bad about all those old games. And found the perfect way to blend those things together. Um, it's great. And it's supported by really snappy, funny writing. Simple but clever writing. Yep. Lots of puns. Oh, Got a so lot of puns. Oh my um, god. Excellent level design. Super fun bosses. Um, it's just, it's a charming little game. And it's only $15. 
And you got a lot, of, a lot for it. Um, and then they're actually rolling out, um, their Kickstarter was successful enough that they hit every single stretch goal they set. So they'll be rolling out free DLC for the game in the nice. oncoming months as well um, as they finish up all of the stretch goal things, um, which are entirely new gameplay modes, new characters to play through the whole story as. Tons of cool stuff. Sweet. Um, so yeah, um, I, I have a hard time knowing how to tackle this as far as the review goes, because all I want to do is gush about how much I love it. <laughs> um, uh, so I guess we could start by doing that. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. I want to mention uh, the, even though this is really secondary to the rest of the game, yeah. um, I want to mention the soundtrack work that we've oh, done absolutely. for Oh, absolutely, yes. So not only is the soundtrack I would work, argue that it's not even secondary, it's a big... It's uh, like it was a big part of the game when I was playing it. I yeah. always took notice of the soundtrack and how much it fit everything. Well, like, they do a fun thing where you can find different songs on different yes. levels and then bring them back to this bard who's in one of the towns, and yeah. then he'll give you money for them. So you have a reason to look for those things, and yeah. then when you go to him, he'll you play can, any of them. Yeah, so you can queue up any of the songs on the soundtrack yes. that you found. For those who are interested too, um, the soundtrack is actually available. Um, All forty-eight tracks is available on Bandcamp. Yes. Um, I forget. And it's a name your price. Yeah. Um, it's Jake Kaufman, I believe. That's the name of the artist. Yes. Um, um, so and a couple of the tracks were done by Manami Matsumae, who's actually the composer for the original Mega Man games. Oh, very nice. They actually got her to do a few of the tracks, which is really cool. Um, so, but that's all up on Jake Kaufman's site, as well as Bandcamp. You said. And it's a name your price thing. Yes, yeah, so you, you can, can pay like a penny for it if you yeah. want. Um, the other cool thing that he does that I think is like really rad is uh, you can for free you can follow a link you can download the sequence um, Nintendo audio files for all of this music. Oh. Um, so if you have a like modded Nintendo Entertainment System, because you can get like cartridges for those that have like USB plugs, uh -huh. and then you can load like ROMs into them. I think that's primarily what they're for. And also you can load um, sounds into them and have it play through the sound card on the system. Oh. So he so they because all this music was made using those a actual old devices. Yeah, one of, that was one of the selling points of this game was that they were actually trying to use. Um, the actual stuff that they would have made old Nintendo music on, as well as the actual color palette available yeah. to the original Nintendo um, for designing all the levels and graphics. So you can download all of the, the files that are like the sequence files, and then you can play them through your yeah. Nintendo system and listen to the Shovel Knight soundtrack on your Nintendo. So that's pretty cool. That's like really rad. Yeah, because I mean the game is absolutely supposed to be like, feel like an old NES game. Yeah. And it does. Um, the graphics are definitely better than they could have been back then. Well, and the it game has just runs it's, more smoothly. It's HD, and the yes. resolution is much higher. Yes, but like as you said, the color palette is exactly it's the almost, same. There's a couple um, differences in the color palette, I believe, but it's almost one to one with yeah. what the NES could actually do. And the way the menu layout are, oh, it's fantastic! It's exactly like yeah. those old games. It's super fun. Um, the the whole game, the controls are super tight. They're super simple. Everything just feels right in it. Um, it's challenging, but not too challenging. Um, some of my only complaints would actually be that there's, I almost wish there was more of a penalty for death in the game, because you lose money for dying, but that's it. Uh, you don't have limited continues or anything, um, and money is fairly easy to come by yeah. in the game, so it doesn't feel like too much of a punishment. And then you can um, buy, even you can, on higher difficulties. Yeah, and then you can get armor that makes it so you lose less money. <laughs> yeah, so on top of that, it's like a little ridiculous. Yeah. Um, there's also uh, um, you you will you will probably have gotten enough money to buy all the upgrades before the end of the game, which is also a little bit of a shame. You go through, so I ended up going through the last couple levels already fully upgraded. Like I didn't feel like I had a goal beyond mm. just beating the game, yeah. um, which made me not care much about dying. Um, but like these complaints are super minor <laughs> um, gripes. I can't think of any major negative to it. Um, oh, I will say that it froze on me once. Oh. Yes, it actually froze on me once on my New Game Plus playthrough. Um, so, there's some kind of glitch in there somewhere, but it, it, other than that, it's, it runs silky smooth, um, and I never had any trouble with it. Um, I don't know what else to say about Shovel Knight. I don't think there's anything it's else fantastic. to say. Yeah. It's fantastic. Even if you've looked at videos and things and say, like, I don't know about this, if you have 15 bucks to spare, get it. 
it's totally worth it. Yeah, especially it if has you have more than enough playtime and content to justify the fifteen dollar price tag. Yeah, if you have any um, interest in platforms at all, you're yes. doing yourself a disservice this probably, by not buying this game. This is probably the the most fun and clever and just well made platformer I've played in a very long time. Um, it's it's just great. Um, so give Yacht Club games their due, and maybe we'll see Sh Super Shovel Knight 2. Super Shovel Knight 2. Somewhere down the line. Super Shovel Knight Brothers. Yeah, that's what I want. <laughs> um, but yeah, so fantastic game. Um, it is available on the PC, Windows, or P uh, Microsoft Windows, Mac OS X, Linux, as well as the Nintendo 3DS and Wii U off of their uh, shop. It's even on Linux. It's even on Linux, You guys. have no excuse. No excuse. You yeah. definitely own something that um, play I, I personally played it on my Wii U. Um, it was awesome. Yeah, um, I've been it playing it on... super nice, um, and the controls were great. Yeah, I've been playing it on PC, and it yeah. runs fantastically. Awesome. Um, so yeah, Shovel Knight. Get it. So what's coming out? Yeah, closing off the show. Closing with, off the uh, show. What game's coming out? There wasn't much to talk about. Um, the only real big thing to bring up would be the final episode of The Wolf Among Us oh, by Telltale man. Games is coming out tomorrow on the everything. Yeah, Except there, for Xbox Live. Xbox Live is due out on the 9th instead. And then there's like um, an iOS version of it that's oh, on the 10th. But it's all the next three days yeah. Wolf Among Us all over you. <laughs> um, so... That's that game is really cool. So I'm looking forward to that. What else is happening? Um, Freedom Planet. Freedom Planet. I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is either. But it's I'm not sorry. even out until the 19th. Um, there's not much. In there's a, let's see, Forza Motorsport Five, Raising yeah. Game of the Year. Last edition. of Us Remastered at the end of the month. Oh God, no one cares about Last of Us Remastered. I know. It's pretty. It's pretty barren until fall, honestly. That's true. So, with that disappointing send off, thank you all for listening. Um, this has been Don't Copy That Floppy on Chipbit Radio. You can listen to us at chip, on Chipbit.net. Download the file. Listen to us in iTunes. Um, you can follow us on Facebook, um, or you can find us on Twitter at DCTF Podcast. Um, thank you for listening. And remember. Don't, Don't copy, copy that, that floppy. floppy.